them in an organized way so I would get the gradient that you see here. The blue actually came from, uh, if anyone is familiar with uh, snapping construction lines or working on a construction mm -hmm. site, there's that beautiful blue powdered pigment that those folks put in those devices to you know, get those chalk lines. And when I saw this color, it was luminescent, it was glowing, and I wanted to start using that in my pieces, and that's why this uh, blue is being used. Um, the, the margins that are sort of surrounding the, the blue and sort of like you know, behind the blue and the white margins, I believe that those come from my experience doing printmaking, which brings things full circle with things, you know, the lithography idea. Um, so yeah, uh, I only recently actually created this frame uh, because I've actually been going into a wood shop and uh, working with raw lumber and sawing things down and that's been a lot of fun for me. Um, so again, working with material and making things with my hands, like all artists do. <laughs> so what, what did you title the piece? Uh, aluminum landscape with blue strips. I just, <laughs> I, I usually title my pieces what they are. It's never anything clever. I want the pieces to kind of communicate whatever it is to that particular viewer, but it's really just a good record for me to understand and remember uh, that particular piece in that particular time. So I just call it what it is. So, and for me, it's an aluminum landscape with blue strips. That's it. I love it because I, you talking about the materials first with the lithography plate, um, and then with the kind of the architectural inspiration and using uh, mm -hmm. the colors from a construction site. It's so earthy in a way, but when I look mm -hmm. at it, I see the sky. I don't know sure. how everybody out there <laughs> feels. And I thought that it was kind of a geometrical take on like clouds and the sky yeah. and um, kind of the fading horizon line with the uh, the big negative space at the bottom and that yeah. seeds. Um, and so it's neat that you the titles don't indicate any interpretation. No. Um, and then you can and then even within the work you can the viewer can interpret even the materials because mm -hmm. they're not super obvious right I mean, so it, the lines are so fine it, it's it's hard to believe that they're hand drawn because as you were saying there's no smudging they're like perfectly yeah. spaced and um it looks it looks like etching or something not, not as yeah. much like drawing so. well the it comes from my experience doing an intaglio etching. I think that's why mm -hmm. I became obsessed with the lines. Mm -hmm. But also, again, you brought that word up, you know, sight. Um, so to me, you know, the painting can be a sight. The, ex the experience that I'm having in a particular time or place can be a sight. Mm -hmm. So it can all be in, you know, sort of, I guess, metaphorically, um, I guess, uh, worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's neat. It's neat to leave it open to interpretation. And right. um, it's also kind of reminds me of like a Rothko color field because the longer mm -hmm. you look at it, the more you get immersed in the lines and in, you know, there's only four colors. Um, and you and you really kind of sink in and, and dive in. So again, that's why you need to come see it in person. Right. <laughs> I'm sure that the video doesn't do it justice, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really intricate and so beautiful and so delicate. Thank you. You're welcome. So this was made in what year was 2011. it? 2011. So okay. uh, yeah, it was quite a while ago when I was going to architecture school and things have changed since then, but it's a nice reminder and um, yeah, it's still around. <laughs> Cool. So we'll fast forward almost a decade and we have two pieces that you just finished yep. right in time for the April show in August. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so these are almost totally different, but also not totally different. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the process of making it, it's a really intricate, involved, detail oriented process, but the subject matter is different than the piece we were just looking at. So why don't you uh, start by describing them and, and explain a little bit about what these pieces have to say. Okay. So these are, uh, you know, usually uh, in my practice, I'm sort of allowing the materials to kind of guide me. I'm following the materials. I'm following my intuition to sort of put these aesthetic compositions together. Um, but for you know, this has been a really interesting year, of course, with the pandemic and all the, the social issues and political issues going on. Uh, so these, these two pieces really came out of me being at home and um, trying to be productive and trying to be productive in a meaningful way, in a different kind of way, because I felt like, you know, the environment really kind of called for that. 
And so previous to all of that, I had been thinking about doing these portraits of uh, uh, missing indigenous women. Um, and I had gathered the photographs. And if, if you look up close, these uh, pieces are composed of pretty much uh, photographs that are taken apart and reconstructed. And so I, like, before this year had even started, I had gathered these photographs and I had the plan to eventually turn them into these uh, figurative pieces. And by the way, I usually don't work in a very figurative way. Usually it's kind of like I said, just the materials doing what, they, what I feel like they want me to do with them. <laughs> so I'm following the materials. Um, but these were a little bit different where I actually found these photographs of these women who were missing. And I intentionally wanted to keep them anonymous, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, and I worked digitally, uh, so that's part of my process as well, to kind of map out and plan how things would be composed. <clears throat> and it was a process sort of taking these photos apart, and that's a metaphor I use in my work a lot. It's called an exploded axonometric, where you take something apart to understand the pieces and how they come back together again. So taking apart these old photographs that were from like 1920, 1930, you know, quite old, some of them just falling apart. So I would kind of have to, you know, part of the, all this process, even the way I'm having to kind of manipulate these photographs so I can actually draw on them so they don't fall apart because they're so brittle. Drawing on these photographs with three pens, three micron pens again, except I'm using black, brown, and red, following my Adobe Illustrator diagram. And so I'm kind of, you know, going into detail a little bit about process mm -hmm. on my end. And um, cutting the photos up and then following my plan to put them back together. And, uh, you know, as eventually representing uh, the photograph or the illustration or the painting, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's a combination of lots of different media. So it's drawing, photography, it's collage. Um, to me, it's painting. Anything on canvas to me is painting. It doesn't necessarily have to be oil or acrylic. What was the subject matter of the historic photographs you drew on? It? Yeah, that was a really interesting process to go through as well, because um, when you're going through photos of folks from 1920, predominantly they're white folks. And so that's the part that is really kind of meaningful for these pieces is really I'm kind of like taking apart this uh, dominant portrayal of culture and putting it back together again to represent these missing indigenous folks. I also think the process intersects with the subject matter in the sense that um, I don't, these images, they kind of dissipate and then mm -hmm. they reform and you have to stand back. If you sure. stand too close, you can't make out the portrait. Um, and I think that's kind of a metaphor for sure. uh, someone going missing or being missing or being right. in that state of being missing. Mm -hmm. um, and taking the pieces and putting them back and making something whole is right. obviously what yeah. we would all hope for right. these individuals and their families and their communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's something really beautiful about the synergy that comes with the right. way that you made the pieces, the way that they appear, uh, the way that the viewer interacts with the pieces right. based on how you made them and the materials you used. So. Yeah. A lot comes out, a lot comes out of the process. Yeah. And, um, I wasn't sure how these were going to turn out. It was just an idea that I had in my head. Like all, every artist starts that way, I believe that. They have an idea in their head, they start and they hope that it's gonna turn out the way that they want it to. And uh, thankfully, you know, the result was, uh, you know, as I expected, where you could actually really read the figure and still also read, if you walk up close and look at these individual pieces, you can see faces, you can see eyes, you can see landscapes, you can see, um, American culture a hundred years ago as it existed, for better or worse. What was the impetus behind drawing on the photos in addition to cutting them? Well, you know, that's sort of a question that I've been trying to answer to myself for a number of years because I do, there's something about lines and the repetition and um, the meditative, the, the process internally on my end. But for me, when I'm applying, or when I was applying the lines to the photographs, it gave me permission to use the photographs within these pieces. Did you, so you did it before you cut them up? Yes, okay. yeah, all, it's like, I have stacks of these things in my <laughs> studio. 
Um, and then I'm organizing them as well. And I mean, there are all these things that you discover through the process. For example, when I'm working with the initial photographs, before I've cut them up, some of them are more brittle and I have to be more careful and I kind of have to bend them mm -hmm. a little bit, even while I'm drawing, but while I'm applying. There are all these like, you know, strange things that you discover about the process along the way. But the other thing is that the photographic processes 100 years ago were quite different then. Mm -hmm. um, so there were these pieces, and every once in a while, if you look closely at these, you can see this gorgeous kind of photographic emulsion, this reflective, sort of like dishwater, you know, uh, I don't know, there's, there, there was something about these photographs, they all had different unique qualities, and then of course I'm looking at the photographs, and sometimes the people are happy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're poor, sometimes they look ridiculously rich, um, it's, it was just this huge spectrum of, you know, and then again, taking it apart and putting it back together. Where did you find the photos? Uh, well, uh, I, I go into antique markets and you can purchase old photographs, like batches of photographs for obscene amounts of money. Um, <laughs> so I would go in there and just, you know, if I saw some at an affordable price, I buy them and I hoard them in my studio. Um, but again, I bought these photographs well into the, this past year and they only now eventually became um, you know, what you see here. And there are more of these in process in my studio okay. currently. But this idea of taking apart, you know what I mean, this culture, you know, from 1920, this predominantly white culture, taking it apart and putting it back together, um, it applies also to things like George Floyd. So I'm currently working on a portrait of George Floyd. Um, so it's, there, it's more than just these portraits. It's something larger from my perspective. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because our material culture has changed so much, and I don't know if anyone gets... To printed photographs, film, right. you know, digital uh, images turned into prints anymore. Right. Everything seems digital, everything seems more ephemeral, and we mm -hmm. don't have these, like, tangible material things that we're leaving behind. Right. It all exists out there. Well, and it was, it was sort of sad, too, you know, because these photos have been lost, and they're mm -hmm. so gorgeous, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have a home anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're just... Orphaned. I don't know. They're, you know, I don't know what the word is, but they're just they, they don't have a place. So I kind of felt like I was, in a sense, kind of giving them a home again as well, like mm -hmm. repurposing these photographs. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope these pieces find a good home too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they yeah. definitely deserve it. Um, how long did they take you, Matthew? Uh, you know, I mean, over this past summer, I had some time off, and I thought it was going to be a very productive summer, but I think, like a lot of us, we've all been distracted with news and social media, and, you know, they call it doom scrolling and all that business. Uh, so I don't have an exact time period, uh, like as far as hours and that sort of thing. I really don't keep track of that sort of information. I used to uh, a long time ago, and then I just finally realized that the piece represents what it is. Um, but yeah, these are the two, the only two pieces I really completed this past summer because I was busy just being anxious and worrying about things. <laughs> okay, so you have some more in the works. Where can people, will people be able to see them? Or uh, well, they're in process. Mm -hmm. So who knows where they're going to go? I don't know that I haven't figured that out yet because a lot of galleries, they just, you know, don't have, uh, they're, yeah, yeah they're, they're shutting their doors. <laughs> so. Someone just asked, is it, are you from the independent? The independent? No. I should have said, I'm sorry, that's my bad, but Matthew teaches up at Danae College that's true. and is an artist. And yep. As well. <laughs> Where can people find you online if they want to see more? Uh, I have a website, MatthewBollinger.com. So two T's and two L's, MatthewBollinger.com. So you can find me there. Well, thank you for being the last uh, artist to do a virtual artist talk for the April show in August. Again, you can see it through September 5th. Make an appointment to visit Art123 Gallery on Friday or Saturday between 12 and 4. Our next show is called Art in Isolation, so kind of getting that what Matthew was just talking about. It's a group of seven artists, and we'll be showing uh, work that they created during the current, well, we're still in it, so <laughs> during this current time right. that we're all living in. Right. Um, and we hope to do a series of virtual artist talks along with that. So continue following Gallup Arts on Facebook and Instagram. And I also wanted to announce that Loom Indigenous Art Gallery has a new show by Najonia Austin up. Uh, so check out Loom Gallery on Facebook and Instagram. She is an abstract expressionist artist and does some incredible work in paint. So thanks, Matthew. Thanks for joining of us. Thanks, everyone, Thank for you, everyone. tuning in. And we will see you all soon.